Did you know it was me? It's hard to tell with this mask on, isn't it? It's also a little harder to breathe. You know, uh, a lot of us don't like this uh, restriction that we're experiencing right now, this sense of limitation. And as we uh, start this uh, message today, we're entering into a series of messages at the church about limitation. You know, there's a philosophy that uh, exists in the world that, that believes that uh, <clears throat> you must always be exceeding your limits. You must always uh, go beyond what the boundary is. And, uh, you know, whether it's achieving success or, you know, establishing your superiority, being enlightened, reaching uh, your unlimited potential, this is uh, often things that we'll hear. And sometimes people will even uh, call this idea faith. So it's partly good because it encourages people to not be dormant, not to stay stuck, but to um, make an effort to, uh, to get somewhere and to accomplish something. And, and in most cases, achievement is a good thing. After all, who doesn't want to reach their goals? The problem with overachievement is that it involves reaching these goals at costs that outweigh the rewards. People often sacrifice their own health happiness and relationships in order to chase a target that always seems to be moving just beyond them. Like that proverb, proverbial carrot hanging on the end of the stick that the, the mule can never quite get to, but it keeps it moving. Well, generally, I think we have great respect for high achievers. We assume that people who accomplish great things must be more faithful, they must be more disciplined, they must be more insightful than their peers. But let me ask you this question. Is that always the case? Does a gold medal Olympian somehow have more of a particular virtue than the bronze medal winner or the ones who go home without success? Uh, while it's, it's, good to have, it's good to have goals, it's, it's good to go the extra mile. Actually, Jesus even talks to us about going the extra mile. Um, these are good things, but I want to flip the, the thought for a minute when we talk about faith and ask, how are you with the things that limit you? The things that you would say are weaknesses in your life. It, it's, uh, do you have a positive view of your limitations? Who, who sees the walls in their life and says, I will be grateful, I will be content with what I cannot do and what I cannot have. Boy, that's, that's a tall order for some. So as we enter into uh, this series of messages over the next few weeks, um, I, I want to um, think about, you know, where uh, does faith show up in the realm of our limitations? Um, we always reward and admire people who achieve great things, but that may not be evidence that they have exceptional faith or exceptional virtue. What if faith is not always a path to highly visible achievement? What if faith is more likely to be found in people that are underachievers and are de demonstrably limited and weak. What is this hidden dimension of faith that is easily missed or misunderstood? Some of you have an incredible amount of guilt and shame in your life because you feel that you are so limited and so weak, and yet that may be the very place in your life where God wants to show um, his, his greatest glory. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11, and if you don't have your Bible with you, I just want to encourage you right now to hit pause and on your remote and or on your phone or wherever you're watching on, hit pause, go grab your Bible, and then come back. And uh, can you do that right now? Okay, let's go get our Bibles. Okay, you got your Bible? Hebrews chapter 11. 
starting at the first verse, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hmm. It seems that faith is based on invisible evidence, not on the things that you or others can point to and see evidence of. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen or things that are invisible. Can you imagine going uh, before a judge and uh, the, uh, the judge says, and uh, can you present uh, evidence uh, to prove your case? And you say, uh, your honor, uh, yes, we have evidence. May I see the evidence? No, your honor, our evidence is invisible. Well, uh, that wouldn't go too far in court, but when it comes to living a life by faith, it goes an incredible distance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And then verse 2 says, For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. Now, if you go on after uh, this message is done and want to read the rest of Hebrews chapter 11, you're going to see all these examples from the Bible of people of God that demonstrated remarkable faith. And, uh, you know, as we look through that list and we say, oh, yeah, there's, there's a Bible hero, there's another one, there's another one, um, what we might sometimes be missing out on when we look at their lives is the absurdity of faith. Think about Abraham. Here is an old man in his 80s uh, looking up at the stars. Uh, and uh, the, the, the sun had set, and he's out there looking up at the sky, and God speaks to him and says, Abraham, I'm going to give you as many descendants, children, grandchildren, and on, as many as the stars in the sky, as numerous as the grains of sand at the sea. And somehow, by faith, Abraham accepted that, even though he was 80 years old and his old wife, Sarah, was barren. God had said, you're going to have a child. You're going to have many, 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 many children. And, well, if you read the rest of the story in Genesis about Abraham, you find out that he, in fact, does have a miraculous son named Isaac. And, uh, but did Abraham live to see as many descendants as the stars in the sky or the grains of sand along the sea? No, he didn't. He, God gave him this dream that exceeded his lifetime. It was a multi-generational dream that is still being fulfilled today, thousands of years later. Makes me wonder sometimes about the, the dreams and the, the vision, uh, visions that we have uh, from God. If sometimes uh, we aren't limited, because a lot of times we're thinking just about our lifetime. What can I accomplish? Uh, by the time you watch this, I'll have uh, celebrated another birthday, the big five nine. And uh, as, as I move down this road, um, you know, and uh, realize that, it, you know, and, and it's a good possibility that uh, a significant part of my earthly life um, has been used up. And uh, Lord willing, I still got uh, another 30, 40 years. I'd like that. But if, if I don't have until tomorrow, uh, that doesn't matter. What matters is that I live this life now by faith. And then the writer in Hebrews says in verse 3, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were, made, were not made, the things that are seen were not made of things which are visible. There we go again. We're talking about creation now and the fact that God creates all that is visible from things that are invisible. 
it seems that faith is based on this invisible evidence, not on the things that you or others can see evidence of. And there's a correlation between God's invisibility and creation's visibility. Likewise, in the same way that we're talking about the invisible, the things that are not yet, the things that are hoped for, likewise, do you know that your point of limitation becomes a platform from which God wants to speak? I'm standing here on the stage at New Song Church as I'm delivering this message. And you know, um, it's, it's a bit of a platform. It's, it's a raised up thing so that you can see the person on the stage all the way to the back. And uh, that elevation helps. And, and your weakness, your limitation is an elevated part of your life that God can stand on and speak. Wow. Think about your limitation and weakness. Thank you, Lord, that you want to speak through my weakness, through my limitations. So now we're going to look into Genesis chapter 1. And in the Genesis account of creation, there's this powerful impulse that defines and determines the shape of things to come. That powerful impulse that determines what's going to be is the voice of God. He initiates with an articulation of what the material realm will become. In what seems like an impossible feat to us, God speaks and the world is formed. God organizes out of the chaos of disorganized materials and an environment takes shape for structured life. Without deep diving into the science of Genesis chapter 1, I want us to see how limitation is an essential tool in the goodness of creation, that God sets limits. If I asked you, is God limited? Almost all, everybody would say, no, God's not limited. Does God limit himself? And in fact, he does. And we're going to see this in the way that he creates. In the way that God creates, we see that he sets limits and he doesn't go beyond his limits. All right, so uh, Genesis chapter 1, we're going to look at six time periods. These time periods are called days. And first of all, we want to acknowledge that God sets a limit in creation to six days. Now, uh, there are uh, theories and opinions about the original language that would say that, well, this is actually six epochs or time periods that God creates in. And others would say, oh, no, no, it says day and it means day. And uh, I, I don't want to get hung up on the, the, the science of it. What I want us to do is the same thing that the ancient people did. Uh, they read this story and they weren't hung up on was this literal days or was this uh, talking about periods of time? They weren't hung up on that. They, they caught the main point, and I hope that we can catch the main point uh, as moderns. You know, what's the main point? The main point is that God created within limited time frames everything that was needed to sustain the life that he was creating. So we're going to look at the seven days now. So, and, and you'll see that when we get to the end of the six days, God says, that's enough. All right, Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at day one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth didn't have any shape, and it was empty. There was darkness over the surface of the waves. At that time, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. He separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, 
he called the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning. It was day one. So at the very beginning, we see that God creates the heavens and the earth, and he establishes the essential building blocks, and the starting point is this chaotic uh, distribution of elements uh, described as a body of water with waves upon it, and from this chaotic environment, God says, let there be light. And so there's a separation between night and day, day and night, light and dark. Now that there is light and that you can see what's going on, we now have a way to understand what God is doing in our own limited way. So it was invisible and so that which was invisible was brought into visibility by God speaking and saying, let there be light. There's a spiritual principle there that exists in creation, and it exists in you as well. That when God says, let there be light, when God illuminates truth to you, you can see things that you never saw before. It was invisible, but God was over it. And in order to facilitate an organization of the matter and the energy he creates, God establishes light and establishes the difference between the presence of light and the absence of it. There's a pattern of variance between light and dark. It's grouped. Light is called day, dark is called night. It is bounded so that we can call this spectral range a day. But this part of the story is limited. How do you get a day without creating a cycle of dark and light that can be limited to a day? Well, perhaps the point here is that the description given and the sequence of events are less important than the principle of what is being said. An essential part of God's limited edition creation is the distinctive properties of dark and light. Before God creates eyeballs to see the light, before God creates photosynthesis, there needs to be a domain in which they can sensibly function. God doesn't create everything all at once, but in one day, in one period of time, he creates this separation of dark and light, and that becomes foundational for all that will follow. Everything is not established at once. And you know, uh, when you come to Jesus and you become a new creation, not everything is cre newly created in you all at once. Your spirit is joined to the spirit of God, and, and there is that, that essential union that takes place uh, when we are saved, when we enter into relationship with Jesus. But our life of new creation has days in it, periods of time, limited times, where God creates new things. Some things need to precede and become an environment for that which follows. Light energy must be limited and focused to be useful in sustaining creation. All right, let's move along now to day two. And we got uh, seven days, so let's, let's get moving here. Genesis chapter one, verse six. God said, let there be a huge space between the waters. Uh, let it separate water from water. And that's exactly what happened. God made the huge space between the waters. He separated the water uh, under the space from the water above it. God called the huge space sky. There was evening. There was morning. It was day two. It should be noted that uh, that this 
this gives us the uh, foundations of a weather system. You have water below, uh, you have the effect of light, which heats and causes uh, evaporation, which forms clouds. And so we're beginning to lay the foundations for weather systems as God creates sky between the water above, the clouds, and the water below. Um, waters above are clouds. Water below is every body of water that exists on our planet, including that water which is underground. And this separation of water up and water down creates a, another limit, a limited space that other things will fill. All right, let's go to day three. The next principle of organized creativity was the establishing of dry land. There needed to be more in this ecosystem that God was developing that would give foundation for creating all kinds of life. So uh, day three, let's look at Genesis 1 verse 9. God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place. Let dry ground appear, and that's exactly what happened. God called the dry ground land. He called all the water that was gathered together seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce plants, let them produce their own seeds, and let there be trees on the land that grow fruit with seeds in it. Let each kind of plant or tree have its own kind of seeds, and that's exactly what what happened, God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, it was day three. You know, ground already existed under the water, but dry ground would be needed as well. So, you know, we would uh, look at the way the earth is constructed and say, well, there had to be some tectonic plates shifting. There had to be some mountains that, that were brought up. There would have to be volcanic eruptions, all of this working together and, and the force of gravity uh, and water going down, land being forced up. And, and so we, we get this uh, now another layer of foundation uh, for life to be brought into. And then uh, the establishing of every kind of vegetation, uh, plant and tree. And uh, the land and the sea have this relationship to one another, they contribute to each other in their own limited ways. And we'll see that when God creates, he creates an ecosystem, he creates parts that have a, a relationship to work with other parts that in turn produces something else. Uh, you could call this synergy. The land and the sea. All right, let's go to day four. Genesis 1, verse 14, God said, let there be lights in the huge space of the sky. Let them separate the day from the night. Let the lights set the times for the holy celebrations and the days and the years. Uh, let them be lights in the huge space of the sky to give light on the earth. So what were we talking about here? We're talking about the sun, the moon, and the stars. Uh, and uh, God uh, creates these on, on day four. And some of you are saying, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, you, you already created light. Where was that light from? And uh, like I said, let's not get hung up on the science of this. Let's get hung up on the idea that God articulates, God uh, speaks out of the invisible and something is created exactly as he wants it to be. So um, God made uh, two great lights, verse 16. He made the larger light, the sun, to rule over the day, and the smaller light, the moon, to rule over the night. He also made the stars. He saw it was good. There was evening, there was morning, it was day four. Um, in our understanding of science, we know that the sun, the moon, and the stars are essential. The sun is uh, essential to the heating and the cooling systems of the earth. Uh, the moon is uh, vital uh, to the Earth's gravitational variance. Um, and we also know that seasons and cycles of growth and the measurement of time 
as well as navigational context all come from the lights in the sky. Uh, the original GPS, they followed the stars. Again, we see that every terrestrial body that God puts in place has distinct limits and symmetry. If God did not limit their distances, the entire globe, perhaps the entire universe, would fail. All right, moving on to verse 20, day five. God said, let the seas be filled with living things. Let birds fly above the earth across the huge space of the sky. So God created the great sea creatures. He created every kind of living thing that fills the seas and moves about in them. He created every kind of bird that flies and God saw that it was good. Fill the water in the seas. He said, have little ones so that there will be many of you. Fill the water in the seas. Let there be more and more birds on the earth. There was evening and there was morning. It was day five. Every living creature was formed but then limited to its own domain. Sharks do not roam through the mountains. And all of the mountain goats are grateful that sharks are not in the mountains. Uh, they are not equipped to be in the mountains. The goats are, the sharks are not. Birds do not build their nest at the bottom of the ocean. And in spite of what you learned in nursery rhymes, Cows do not jump over the moon. Every creature is designed and suited to the limits of their domain, including you. God gives each creature a limited time to be born and to die and for successive generations to take place. The death of all creatures becomes part of the cycle of new life being born to live out their common purposes in their domain. If all creation lived forever without dying, there would eventually be an oversaturation that would overwhelm the ecosystems. So God limits the extent of individual life so that generations can occur. Now, eternal life, well, that's another topic and, and uh, that's uh, to be discussed another time, but I'm talking about the limits of the creation that we are born into, that God has uh, very kindly and wonderfully put into place for us. Now let's look at day six. In the crowning achievement of creation, God establishes another order of beings to be placed that would bring orderly care and attention to the planet. And you and I, we are those beings. God has placed a sense of himself in us. We are different from all the other creatures. We have the unique capacity with responding with our personality back to God. We are uniquely endowed in all creation with a God awareness and a nature to create. Just as our creator created us, we have this exceptional ability to create many good things and to exercise responsibility. Genesis 1 24, God said, let the land produce every kind of living creature. Let there be livestock and creatures that move along the ground and wild animals. And that's exactly what happened. God made every kind of wild animal. He made every kind of livestock he made every kind of creature that moves along the ground, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make human beings so that they are like us. Let them rule over the fish in the seas and the birds in the sky. Let them rule over the livestock and all the wild animals, and let them rule over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own likeness. He created them to be like himself. He created them as male and female. God blessed them. He said to them, have children so there will be many of you. Fill the earth, bring it under your control. 
Rule over the fish and the seas and the birds in the sky. Rule over every living creature that moves along the ground. I'm giving you every plant on the face of the whole earth that produces its own seeds. I'm giving you every tree that has fruit with seeds in it. All of them will be given to you for food. I am giving you every green plant as food for all the land animals and all the birds in the sky. Uh, I'm also giving the plants to all the creatures that move along the ground. I'm giving them to every living thing that breathes and that's exactly what happened. God saw everything he had made and it was very good. There was evening and there was morning. It was day six. Do you see the progression that's happened through day one, two, three, four, five, six? As God uh, further creates and uh, creates something else that is good, when it's all brought together with us in it, God says, oh, this is very good. That's an important foundation for understanding your new creation that God has created you to be a human being in the earth with a new heart, a heart that is reimagined, refashioned, refilled with the very nature of God, the image of God in us. So we have six days and then God says, that's enough, day seven. And remember, God's taken from the invisible and made something visible. Genesis chapter 2. We're just going to look at three verses here in Genesis chapter 2. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. By the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. So on that day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. He blessed it because on that day, he rested from all the work he had done. As creatures made with this invisible image of God embedded into our nature, we must learn to reach day seven. There is a time of completion where we can join God in saying, it is finished and now I can rest and now I can enjoy all that has been created. Do you have that seventh day in your life? You know, there are many people that are so um, caught in the work cycle, the creation cycle, the uh, achievement, accomplishment, uh, and, and, and they never get to day seven. God limits to six days, and there are some who never limit, but they just keep working and working and working. And, and then we would uh, think that somehow, because we are so achievement-focused, that somehow that's a virtue. But we've missed out on the most important day, and that's the day when it's finished, when it's complete, when you're not going to do anything else today except enjoy. And God is doing that, and he invites us to experience that seventh day. It is the work of Jesus to create our reunification with God, to restore that image of God that is in us. And on the dreadful, horrific cross, Jesus cries, it is finished. The work is completed. Now a time of holy rest is here for Jesus. After he finishes his work, he cries out, it is finished. And then he passes, and, and uh, the rest follows, the resurrection. In, you know, in Genesis, we meet the God who says, that's enough. And on the cross, we see God saying, that's enough. 
we see God limiting himself to six days of creation, not 18 days of creation. Although it's possible that God could have kept creating and expanding on and, and developing other systems, uh, that's very possible. But what we do know is that that which he did create came from the invisible into the visible. And that's where we live. If Jesus can say, it is finished, if the creator after creation can say, it is finished, can you say, it is finished? Are you content with the limits that God has placed on you? Have you thanked God for the blessing of thoughtful limits? Over the next few weeks, as uh, different uh, members of our pastoral team bring, bring a message on limitation, we want to uh, move from being people that are always discontent and always ashamed of our limitation to people who embrace the limits that God sets and be content and enjoy and live in that light of saying, God's work is finished. And now this message is finished. So I want to challenge you today with the rest of your day, under your breath, through the day, to say, it is finished. God has completed what God has created. And yes, we live in hopes. We're living by faith because we know in reality that there's a lot of things that are still not finished. And, and we know that there's more work to be done. But right now, today, or tomorrow, you need a day, a day seven, when you can sit back and say, it is finished. Would you pray with me right now? Lord Jesus, I thank you that uh, we can look to the God who created all things good, put it all together and said it's very good. And, and so, Lord, we would uh, give you thanks right now um, because that which you are doing and have done is very good. And I pray uh, for those that are on the treadmill that do not know how to stop and rest, those who do not know how to be content. Lord, envelop them with your presence, sit them down, show them all that's been created, all that's been laid out. And Lord, may we find ourselves saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, it is finished. It is finished.